Hi, my name is Aileen Ziegler, and I'm the theater arts teacher at Brown Talbot School. I am incredibly proud to welcome you to this performance of Gathering Grimm by John Newman, performed by BT Theater. What began this winter as a show plans to be on stage, full of physical character creation, choreography, stunts, creativity of students both on stage and off, changed in March when we were asked to stay home. We decided to continue to persevere, to make these stories our own and to develop our own virtual production, the blessing of John Newman. So what you're gonna see today is that work, that effort, that creativity. I'm so proud of the depths that these students have gone to, to create, to explore, to develop and tell stories. Those are the Grimm brothers. As Wilhelm Grimm tells us, it is important to allow your wings to show because our flaws are what allow us to fly. I'm proud of these students for developing their flaws, the challenges, their limitations, and using those to lead to their success. They've risen to the occasion. And I believe that you will see that too. We wouldn't have gotten here without all of the help and support of so many around us, from choreographers to assistant directors, to faculty and staff assistants, to the community that submitted art and music, to those who edited the film together. Thank you so much for all that you have done to support the growth of these theater art students. Please join me in celebrating the flaws, the challenges, of these students and seeing how they have learned to fly right from their own home. Please enjoy the show, Gathering Grim by John Newman.
Castle Westphalia, now part of Germany, 1810, evening. At rise we hear a violin and see a representation of an orderly drawing room stage right and a disorderly drawing room stage left. A forest stretches behind the parlors on the sides and the open spaces in the middle. As the lights come up on center stage, we see Gretchen Wild, a young mother, carrying her baby, and Loti Grimm, a young teenager, who carries a traveling bag. They are both wearing traveling gear as they have just come from a carriage that brought them from Mago. Thank you for taking me home, Gretchen, and thank you for letting me stay with you. I hope I wasn't a burden. Loti Grimm, you were a blessing. You cooked and cleaned and cared for the baby. Well, a baby is easy. Five brothers are hard. You're too young to be caring for five older brothers. I promised my mother before she died. Jakob told me to bring him back stories from Marburg. I have none to give him. You went to Marburg for a rest. I did find one story, but I'm not going to share it with my brothers. I'm keeping it for myself. I heard a new tale last week. Perhaps if I told it to Jakob? Don't tell my brothers any more stories. Not unless they acknowledge who told them. You've persuaded me, Lotti. Now let me persuade you. Come to, bowl with my, come to the bowl with my sisters tonight. I told you, Gretchen, I can't. Is it because you don't have a gown? Hannah could lend you. Jakob won't go and he won't let the rest of us either. He's King Jerome's personal librarian. He'll be expected at the bowl. Jakob hates the French king and despises his French army. He wants them out of our German lands. And yet Jakob has learned to hold his tongue. It's the one thing we have in common. The apartment will be in ruins. Maybe they've learned to clean up after themselves. Only a sister could care for the brothers Grimm. Lilti enters the Grimm apartment stage left, while Gretchen exits stage right with her baby. We hear a phonetic folk tune played on a violin by Kyle Grimm. The drawing room is in disarray, strewn with papers, sheets, clothes, and dishes. Jakob Grimm, the eldest brother, carries papers and is searching fr frantically for missing ones. Wilhelm Grimm, the next eldest and Jakob's literary partner, sits or lies on a chair or sofa, dilig diligently applying the doctor's latest remedy to his exposed chest. Ludwig Grimm paints a still life of a fruit bowl. Ferdinand Grimm steals a piece of fruit from Ludwig's still life and Ludwig chases him. Loti is disheartened by the chaos, but is not surprised by it. Music fades as the brothers finally notice their little sister Loti. Loti, welcome home. Wilhelm, another remedy? Orders from the doctor. A doctor who must be paid. I wish I could earn the fee myself. Loti, we need your stories from my book. I missed you too, Jakob. We went to Marburg to rest. You promised to bring back stories, Loti. You promised to take care of the apartment. <laughs> we can't keep a servant, sister. But you've made your sister a servant. I'm a maiden, not a maid, and I'm tired of you treating me like one. We don't treat you like a maid, Loti. If we did, we'd fire you. Look at this mess. You could help me clean it up. Sister, we're men of letters. Some of us are. You and Ferdinand dropped out of school. To help support the family. Ludwig, what are you doing? Painting. In your best shirt? Honestly, Ludwig, now Lottie will have to wash it. Look at your own shirt, Ferdinand. You can at least iron your collars. But we like the way you do it. Is that my only purpose in this family? To care for my brother's shirts? Of course not, Loti. Your purpose is to care for your brothers. Now, we can't find most of our folktale manuscripts. I'm surprised you can find the furniture. Loti, this is urgent. Why? Didn't Jakob write you? I doubt he could find a pen. Brentano wants to publish our folktales. All of them? As many as I can find before he leaves tomorrow. I've made a list. Uh, I've marked the ones that were missing. Is this your preface? These authentic tales were recorded straight from the hearts of peasant cottages. You cleaned my study before you left. The hearts of peasant cottages, you heard them in our neighbor's parlors. You know my filing system better than I do. I would like to thank my professors at Marburg for encouraging me in this project. It looks like you named everyone at the university. That will make them buy my book. 
but you don't thank the maidens who told you the stories. The maidens heard them from servants, and their servants heard them from peasants. You're splitting hairs, Loti. I need to find my manuscripts. And my friends need to be named. Did you hide the manuscripts? Did you steal them? Did you burn them? If you did, I'll burn you at the stake. Jakob, you're talking about our sister. And I'm talking about the future of our family. I'll show you where they are when you show me some respect. Your friends gave them freely without asking for recognition. You men, you boys, you do as you please and you take what you want. Well, for once, a maiden is telling you no. Find the table. I'll fix us some supper. And then I'm going to the ball. The ball? King Jerome's ball? Napoleon's blockhead brother? It's better than saving for my own blockhead brothers. Das ist verboten. If you want to find your manuscripts, you'll let me go. Then go. Fall in love with a Frenchman. If he's kinder than you, then vive la France. Loti, do you know what these stories could mean to us Germans? Do you know what they mean to my friends? The stories could make us a people. They'll remind us we're German until we can drive out the French. Beethoven fights them with music. We fight them with our stories. We can't fight the French. Jakob serves the French king. That makes all of us French. I hold my nose and I do what I must to care for my younger brothers. And I'll hold my nose and do what I must to care for my brother's sister. I won't fall in love with a Frenchman, Jacob, but let me play the lady just this once. And then I'll play the servant until my brothers grow up. She knows how to make an exit. She ought to be on stage. Staying with Gretchen was supposed to calm her down. I think she's angrier than before. She has good reason. Don't take her side, Wilhelm. What if she refuses to find the manuscripts? Well, then Brentano won't publish our stories. Then we must gather the stories from the girls who told them. Unless Loti gets to them first. The brothers rush off. Mimi and Rudolf Field are preparing to leave from the orderly parlor. They are dressed in their everyday middle-class clothes, as they are too young for the ball, and are headed to the park instead. Dorchenfield, slightly younger than Mimi, chases behind them. It's not fair, Mimi. I want to see the fireworks, too. I'm really, really sorry, Dorchen. Father says you're too young, but next year you'll be ready. But Rudolph gets to go. Because I'm a boy. Boys are lucky. Boys keep girls safe. I don't want to be safe. I want to be free. I have an idea. Rudolph will meet you at the Grimm's. Ferdinand will leave without us. We'll hurry. Father won't let a young lady go out alone. I won't be alone. Who will be your escort? Go! Gretchen, Hannah, and Rosefield enter. Gretchen, as the young wife and mother, is dressed for home, while the other three sisters wear formal gowns and are preparing to go to the ball. You ought to come with us, Gretchen. You came all the way home from Marburg. Mother will care for the baby. No, Lizette, not without my husband. He should have come home with you from Marburg. He hates dancing and despises the French. I'm glad your husband is taking you. Maybe I'll find a husband tonight. <laughs> Who wants a husband, Hannah? I just want to dance. Put on your gloves, Rose. The carriage will be here any minute. What will you do while we're gone? <sighs> I'll sit by the ashes and feel sorry for myself. Really? That's what Ashenputl did, and she didn't have a baby. Who's Ashenputl? The girl whose sisters wouldn't let her go to the ball? I can't believe you haven't heard her story. If it's the one I think it is, I heard it from my French teacher, but he called her Cendrillon. It might be the one my English teacher told us, but she called her Cinderella. Tell me her story. The carriage is late. Tell it, Gretchen. <sighs> Very well, as long as the baby stays asleep. As the wife of a rich man was dying, she and her daughter took one last walk in the garden. Dear child, always be good and righteous. Providence will help you and I will watch over you. 
After the mother died, her daughter tended faithfully to her grave. Snow covered the land in a white blanket, and, when it melted, the man had married a new wife. She had two younger daughters, with beautiful features, but selfish hearts. You stupid goose! You should be taking care of us! That wrap of yours would look better on me. They took away her beautiful clothes and made her dress in rags. Just look at the fine princess. How decked out she is. They nagged her from morning to night. Carry water. Make a fire. Cook our breakfast. Wash our clothes. And pluck these peas and lentils from the ash. Ajimtal sets about the task as the older stepsister steps away laughing mockingly. The younger stepsister turns back and starts to help Ashenpotl. I'm sorry, you shouldn't have to... Sister! Do everything we say. Ashenpotl said nothing, working long into the night and falling asleep in the ashes. One day, the father was about to go on a journey and he asked his daughters what they'd like him to bring home. Dresses and pearls. Jewels and shoes. Just bring me a branch that brushes by your carriage. When the father returned, he gave his daughters what they wished for. While the stepsisters reveled in their new finery, Ashenpotl took the branch and planted it at her mother's grave, which grew into a magical tree. One day, news arrived at the home. The king is giving a ball. Every young lady must come so the prince can choose his bride. Ashenpotl, comb my hair. My shoes need to be brushed, if you can help me. Tie my corset. And someone needs to iron my gown. <laughs> We're, We're going, going to, to the ball. ball. May I go with you? You, Ashenpotl? You're dirty and dusty. You wish to go to the ball. <laughs> The king's order says every young lady. Does she look like a lady? How can she dance when she has no proper gown? I have. How can she dance when she has no proper shoes? Maybe I could. If I can make myself presentable and attend to you, may I go? Not even if you were dressed in gold. Now, sister, let's be fair. Give her a chance. Very well. Fair is fair. I'll empty this bowl of peas and lentils into the ashes. If she can pick them out by the time the carriage comes, we'll let her into the carriage. <laughs> She'll be covered in ash from head to foot. Pigeons, robins, turtle doves, and all birds under heaven. Pluck the lentils from the ash while I attend my sister's. And so, Ashenputtel helped her sisters get ready while the birds picked out all of the lentils. I have done all you asked. Now, may I go to the ball? Sister, she's, the lentils are back inside the bowl. We can't refuse. She did the task, but look at her. She disgraces us at the ball. Then lend me your meanest garment and loan me your plainest shoes. You could have asked for jewels and shoes, but you asked for a branch. Your foolishness will cost you. Be content with what you wished. <sighs> There's the baby. Finish the story, Gretchen. I'll be right back. Let me help you. She can't leave us in suspense. Rose, you're going to a real ball tonight. So, I won't be able to enjoy it until I hear the rest. I'll tell it to you. I heard it from my French teacher. Ashenbuttel wept bitter tears and ran to her mother's grave. There, she was comforted by her fairy godmother. The old woman paid no mind to the maiden's tears and ordered Ashenbuttel to pick and empty a pumpkin, which she did without complaint. And the godmother changed it into a fine carriage. She asked Ashenputtel to catch six live mice, which she did with some difficulty. 
and the godmother turned them into fine white horses. The godmother touched Ashenputtel's worn out dress, which the maiden had carefully mended, and all at once it was changed to gold. That's not the way I heard it in Malberg. Then how did Ashenputtel get to the ball? She got a dress from her magical tree and she walked all the way to the ball. Ashenputtel was so dazzling that her stepsisters didn't even recognize her. The prince approached her and he took her by the hand. May I have this dance? And they danced the night away. Anytime somebody else asked the prince to dance, he politely replied, I've already found my partner. The prince and Ashenputtel continued to dance, avoiding the stepsisters who try to break in. The dance ends. Thank you, your majesty. It's been a lovely evening, but I must be getting home. Then let me escort you. Oh, it's quite all right, your majesty. I know my way. My lady, I insist. The birds carried away her dress, and when the stepsisters arrived at home, Ashenputtel was in her regular dirty smock in the ashes. But in her haste, she had left one golden shoe at the ball. So the prince ordered every woman in the kingdom to try it on, to try and find Ashenputtel. As the older sister tried to get the shoe onto her foot, she muttered to herself, I'll fit into this shoe if I have to cut off my toe. And so she did. The younger stepsister is revolted. With the shoe on her foot, the older stepsister is accepted and reluct reluctantly by the prince. And they start to walk away, with the sister limping and wincing in pain. The prince would have taken her away, but a bird whispered in his ear. Coo, 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 there's blood in the shoe. This is not the one for you. And so the prince returned the false bride. When the younger sister tried on her shoe, it still wouldn't fit. So the older sister tried to help her. You'll fit into the shoe if I have to cut off your heel. And so she did. The younger stepsister stifles a scream as the older stepsister manages to get the shoe on the foot. The younger stepsister bows to the prince, who accepts her reluctantly. They start to walk away, and with the young woman wincing in pain. As the prince was about to leave with her, suddenly a bird whispered in his ear. Coo, 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 there's blood in the shoe. This is not the one for you. And so the prince returned the false bride. He was about to leave, but suddenly he saw Ashenputtel and looked in her eyes behind her dusty face. My lady, please try on the shoe. I know it will fit, for I already have its mate. Well, I need to check that the baby's still asleep. Well, finish the story. Did Ashputtel marry the prince? Of course she did. I don't need to tell you that. A woman doesn't have to marry a prince just because he loves her. What happened to the stepsisters? Ashenputtel, frankly, forgave her stepsisters. She housed them in the palace where they met and married two great lords, and they all lived happily ever after. Maybe in the French story, but not in the German. The stepsisters got what they deserved. On the day of the wedding, the stepsisters arrived. The stepsisters. F. On the day of the wedding, the stepsisters attended to try and appease the royal family and share Ashenputtel's good fortune. So, birds flew into the church and pecked out the stepsisters' eyes, so they were punished for their wickedness for the rest of their days. A more memorable ending, I must say. I like the French ending better. The French believe in mercy, but the Germans believe in justice, and justice makes for better stories. Jakob Grimm, how dare you waltz into our parlor? I am your next door neighbor. I simply came over to borrow a story. Or steal one? Have you been standing there the whole time? Yes, in your family's apothecary. I could hear you through the archway. Legally, it's a place of business, and a citizen has a right to be there. We're trespassing. 
eavesdropping, not trespassing. I studied the law, and the law is on my side. This story isn't yours. You heard it from Gretchen. Who heard it in Marburg? Who heard it from who knows where? No one can own a story. Then why can you sell stories to a publisher? Because I'm a scholar, and you're not. Because you're a man, and I'm not. Lutti told us not to share any more stories. Give us your transcription of Aschenputtel. Possession is the better part of the law. Very well. You've got one more story, but that's it. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Jakob, what are you doing here? Loti, uh, you look... Like a lady. Like you're living beyond our means. I lent her the gown. I lent her the shoes. And I did her hair. The Vilt are my fairy god sisters. L Loti, I need help gathering the stories. Brentano's leaving tomorrow after the ball. If Brentano can go to the ball, why can't I? I've been cleaning the study, and I've only found some fragments. They must not be very useful if you came here looking for more. You're spoiling her evening, Jakob. All right, I'm leaving. I got one story, and Ferdinand may get more. He went with Dorcha and Udolf to see the fireworks. Ferdinand went with them? You forbade us from watching the fireworks. You said it's King Jerome belching his power. But, but if he goes with them, Mimi might give him a story. Share any stories? And neither will Dorchin. Dorchin? She didn't go with them, did she? Father said she's too young. But boys her age are allowed. You mean Mimi disguised her? I'll make sure Father doesn't find out. Tonight, I'll pretend I'm a lady and Dorchin will pretend she's a boy. Guess who will be more free? A park overlooking the palace later that evening. Ferdinand Grimm, Mimi Vild, and Rudolf Vild enter. Ferdinand shows them a place to sit. Here you are, Mimi. That's the best spot in the park. They shoot the fireworks from that tower. Thank you for bringing us, Ferdinand. Look at me, Rudolph. I'll never wear dresses again. Father wouldn't approve. You're lucky, you're lucky he didn't catch you, Dorshan. Boys get to have all the fun. And all the responsibility. That's right. We have to take care of the girls. Take care of us? Are you joking? Who does all the cleaning and the cooking and the mending? But you don't have to work. You're right, Rudolph. We should be grateful pets and men who keep us. Uh, women don't have to go to war like men do. Do you think you'll be drafted, Ferdinand? Probably. Unless I volunteer. And I'll be ready. I'd be willing to go to war. Really, Doshin? See other places? Shoot a gun? Roll in the grass? Sleep in a tent? March in the mud? Lose a leg? But soldiers have adventures. Like boys do in stories. Girls just get to be rescued. How about you, Mimi? Would you go to war? Of course not. Even if you had to protect your family? But that's not my responsibility, it's yours. What if they force you to fight for the French? They couldn't make me do that, could they? No, they could force my brothers and I. Jakob works for the French, so any one of us could be drafted for their army. But Lottie wouldn't get drafted. She's safe because she's a girl. Girls are safe from cannons, but not from kitchens. Boys can choose the lives they lead. Girls can only wish. Okay, let's, let's forget about all that. Let's remember why we're here. We're here so Ferdinand can steal a story. Most boys just steal kisses. I, I, I brought you here to, to see the fireworks, Dorchin. But, um, but while we're waiting... <laughs> while we're waiting, I might as well tell you a story. Oh, no, I mean, I wasn't expecting you to... Then why did you bring your notebook? <sighs> Jakob needs a story, and you tell the best ones of them all. How can I resist your flattery? Doshen, 
Lodi told us not to tell stories unless we're probably acknowledged. Jakob can't name you. It's, scholars want stories from peasants. But we're not peasants. We're middle class and educated like you. I exactly. And a story's a story, no matter who tells it. But make sure you get credit for telling it. Well, maybe I could tell you. Dorchen, don't betray Lottie. I'll, uh, sweeten the deal. Where did you get an orange? It's from Ludwig's Fruit Bowl. The one he's painting? It's round and orange. I'm pretty sure he can paint a circle. A stolen orange for a stolen story? Very well. Shen. It's not for the orange. It's so other schoolgirls can hear it. Once upon a time, when wishing still helped, there lived a king's daughter, as beautiful as the sun itself. When the dates grew hot, she would toss her golden globe in the air. She loved her golden globe, so perfect and whole. The frog princess drops the golden globe. Ferdinand plays the frog. But one day, it slipped from her fingers and the glistening sphere sank deep into the dark water, and the frog said, What's the matter, princess? Your tears could move a stone to weep. Go away, you splashing frog. I'm crying because I lost my golden globe. What would you give it? What would you give me if I returned it safe and full? Uh, my gown. Um, my pearl necklace, my jewels, my golden crown. I have no use for things. But if you will let me eat from your table, drink from your cup, eat uh, and rest on your cushion, I'll return your treasure. I promise all you ask. Then I will help you. Stupid frog, does he think I'll keep a promise to him? Here it is, princess. Perfect and whole. My golden globe! And the princess ran back into her palace and slammed the door behind her. Wait! Take me with you! That evening, as the princess dined with the king, there was a knock at the palace door. The servant, played by Dorshan, answers the door as the princess and the frog king, played by Rudolph, dine together. Who's knocking? There's no one here but a frog. The, the princess made me promises. Ask if she's forgotten what she's promised. The servant leaves the frog and approaches the king and princess at supper. I see you kept your golden globe secure. I never lose it in a million years. Your majesty, there's a frog at the door? Frog, you say? Yes. He insists on in dining with the princess. Daughter, did you invite a frog to supper? Oh, father, I had to save my golden globe. I promised him whatever he demanded. Shall I tell the frog to go away? A promise made is debt unpaid. But father... Dine with your frog and be grateful. The king leaves the table, and the frog takes his place. Splish, splash, splish, splash, up the marble steps, squish, squash, squish, squash, into the king's own chair. Help yourself, you slimy beast. My hands can swim, but they can't hold a spoon. They'll have to feed me. I won't feed a frog. Then I'll just take back my treasure and leave. Very well. I'll keep my promise. The princess feeds the frog a single spoonful. Mmm, most tasty. Now, give me wine to wash it down. The princess offers the frog the cup, but he shows her his hands, and she raises it to his lips. Most refreshing. Now let me rest on your cushion. Rest on the floor, you nasty croaker. And with that, the princess dashed the frog to the floor. When he landed, the frog's curse was broken. 
and he turned back into a handsome prince. For a man will always be a frog until a woman breaks him. And a man will only be a prince because a woman makes him. Thorfinn tosses the orange back to Ferdinand. Keep your orange, Ferdinand. That's not why I told you the story. Take it, Thorfinn. The princess must have her golden globe. It makes her whole. You can be whole without me, but I can't be whole without you. Ferdinand, was that supposed to be romantic? What's he talking about? Ferdinand is in love with me. Since when? I, I, I've always loved you, Dorchen. And I've always had a crush on your brother, Wilhelm. What does it matter? You're too young to get married. You're too young to even be talking of love. Rudolph breaks in between Dorchen and Ferdinand, steals the orange, and sits on the ground in front of them and peels it. If no one's gonna eat this, I will. Look! Fireworks! How did you know I loved you? Maidens always know when they're loved. I can, I can see why you'd love Wilhelm. <laughs> no one could ever love Jakob. The Grimms and Wilds are like brothers and sisters. Maybe that will change one day. Maybe, but not today. Look at that one. It's enormous. Dorshin and Ferdinand look at the sky. You know, Jakob says fireworks are the king's way of flaunting his power. They're powerful, but also beautiful. Stories are beautiful, but they're also powerful. Blue, white, and red. Like the French flag. Where are your brothers tonight? Seeking stories from other schoolgirls. You, you don't love Carl or, or Ludwig, do you? Tell me a story, Ferdinand. Once upon a time, there was a frog who wanted to be a prince so that he could hold hands with a princess. Here, have some orange. The Hasenflug family parlor, late that evening. Ludwig Grimm paces in the Hasenflug's parlor with Susetta Hasenflug. Susetta prepares to spin flax on a spinning wheel. I'm sorry my sisters are out so late. I thought they'd be home by now. Why are you spinning flax, Susetta? Your family can afford to buy cloth. Why do you paint pictures, Ludwig? Your family has paint on its walls. I paint because I enjoy it. Do you enjoy spinning? Father likes us to be busy, and so does my husband. Malkin Hastenflug enters in nightgown and robe. Are they home yet, Susetta? No, Malkin, and you're supposed to be in bed. You promised I could see them when they got home. I expected they'd be home earlier. You should have gone with them. Then who would have stayed home to take care of you? Go to sleep, Malkin. Tumma pro me. Hey, toi, cher Malkin. Oli. Malkin reluctantly goes to bed. You still speak French in this home? Father likes us to remember that we're French. That's why the Germans don't like us. Malkin returns. I'm still awake, Suzette. I might as well see them. Malkin Hassenflug, it is improper for a young lady to appear before a gentleman in her nightgown. Je ne suis pas demoiselle et n'est-il pas gentle homme. What did she say? She said that she is no young lady and you, Ludwig Grimm, are no gentleman. Very well, Malkin. You can stay up with us. 
I wish I could have gone to the ball like Ashba told. My fairy godmother could have made me a ball gown. And made you seven years older. Enjoy being young, Malkin. Soon you'll be married like me. But then I'll have my prince. And you'll have to obey him. My prince doesn't let me dance or tell stories. He says it's not respectable. Yes, but if I had my prince, I wouldn't have to be pretty. To a leash, Mary. Don't lie to me. My eyes are crossed and my nose is crooked. Princesses are supposed to be beautiful. Janetta and Marie Hassenflug arrive, wearing ball gowns. I am sorry we were out so late. We didn't want to leave. I've never had so much attention from men. It's because you're pretty, Marie. It's because I speak French. Napoleon's officers hate to speak German. Jeanette speaks French too, but they talk to you because you're pretty. Malkin is afraid she won't get a husband. You wouldn't want one now, would you? Your green fruit, Malkin, you need to ripen. I'll be a sour apple when I grow up. Ludwig, what are you doing here? I'm looking for a folk tale. Did you leave one on the coat rack? Father might have hung it in the wardrobe. Mr. Brentano has offered to publish their stories, if they can get them to him by tomorrow. I love to see my name in print, Jeanetta Hassenflug. Women don't get to be authors, Jeanetta. They'll be published as the tales of Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm. This sounds like they're leaving someone else. I know. They don't credit Surrey to the rest of the brothers. Or to Lucy. She didn't help gather them. She introduced you to us. They should credit the stories to the Brothers Grimm. How about the Brothers and Sisters Grimm? Don't you think of us as sisters? When I grow up, I'm going to publish my own stories. Women can't publish stories, own property, or keep their family name. It's not fair, Suzetta. No man promised life is fair. I'm sorry to bother you so late, but I need another story. Do you want a happy ending or a sad ending? One that ends with happily ever after. Then you'd better ask Marie. Do you have any stories you haven't told us? I have one, but you'll claim it as your own. Loti warned us. Don't share it, Marie. It's yours. Go ahead and share it. It won't have a woman's signature, but it will tell a woman's story. Very well. There's a tale from France that our grandmother told us. It can't be French. You can say that you heard it in Germany. Jeanetta and Marie are home now, Malkin. You promised you'd go to bed. No, Suzetta. She needs to hear this one. In times of old, there was a beautiful queen. You see? Queens are always beautiful. And her baby girl was just as pretty. All babies are pretty until they grow up. The time came for the christening. There were 13 wise women in the kingdom, but the queen only had plates for a dozen, so one of them wasn't invited. Twelve wise women bestow their gifts on the infant. The wise woman blessed the baby with gifts. One gave her wisdom, another gave her grace, and so on, until the eleventh had bestowed her gifts. Did any of them give her beauty? One gave her a crooked nose to keep her safe from shallow men. You made that part up. When the eleventh had bestowed her gift, the first wise woman appeared. On her thirteenth birthday, the girl will prick her finger on a spinning wheel spindle and fall. The queen was devastated and held her daughter close, but the twelfth wise woman had not yet given her gift. When the princess falls, she will not die. She will sleep until true love awakens her. They named the princess Briar Rose and destroyed all the spinning wheels in the kingdom. The wise woman's words proved true. The girl was polite, kind, and sensible, like you. Briar Rose explores the castle and the story area. On the princess's 13th birthday, the queen rejoiced that the danger was almost past. She gave the princess a key that opened every door in the palace. The princess wandered the twisted, 
corridors and explored every room and chamber. At the top of a watchtower, she opened the door and found the wise woman winding thread around the spindle. What are you doing? I'm winding, my dear. I'm winding. What are you holding? A spindle, my dear. And the princess reached out to touch the spindle. She pricked her finger and fell into a deep sleep. Briar Rose pricks her finger and collapses. The wise woman thought she had succeeded and escaped as a thick briar hedge covered the tower. The young maiden slept for seven years. Any who approached her tower were bloodied by the thorns until a worthy young prince appeared. After seven years, a noble young prince approached the tower. He touched the thorns, and while they hurt him, they turned into buds. As the hedge retracted, the princess awakened and went to the tower window. The prince and princess gazed at each other and began to fall in love. And the princess married the prince. Whether her nose straightened out or not, the prince never noticed because he loved her completely, as all men should do. Is that the way you heard it from your grandmother? It's the way my sister should hear it. You can't just make up a folktale. It has to be original, passed down from generations. I'm sorry to have bothered you. I can tell you a story, Ludwig, and I'll tell it the way I heard it from my German nursemaid. It's the story of the three spinners. I love that one. You start and we'll help. I told that one to my husband on our wedding day. He was not amused. Tell it to me quick. It's getting late. Janetta sits at the spinning wheel, grumpily. There once was a maiden who did not want to spin, and no matter what her mother said, she refused. Finally, her mother hollered at her daughter. You are the laziest girl in the kingdom. Just then, the queen strolled by the cottage. Woman, why are you hollering at your daughter? The mother was embarrassed to have a lazy daughter, so she told the queen, No matter what I do, I can't get my daughter to stop spinning flax. Well, there's nothing I love more than the sound of spinning. Let me take your daughter with me to the castle, and there she can spin as much flax as she likes. And so the daughter went with the queen to the castle, where she sat the girl at a spinning wheel. Spin all the flax in this room by morning, and you shall marry my son. Your industry is dowry enough. But if you shall fail, I will shame you before the kingdom, and none shall ever marry you. The maiden was terribly frightened, for she could not have spun all that flax in a hundred years. In her distress, she went to the castle window, looking for anyone passing by. She saw three strange women. The first had a huge broad foot, the second one had a lip that hung over her chin, and the third had an enormous thumb. What seems to be the matter, young lady? Can we be of any assistance? We can be extremely helpful, but alas, no one ever asks. My dear ladies, the queen has ordered me to spin all this flax into thread by morning. If I succeed, she'll let me marry the prince. If I fail, she'll make me a public example. Oh, we can spin your flax in no time at all. But our help will come at a price. You must invite us to your wedding and claim us as your aunts. If you do so, you shall live happily for as long as you are married. You won't regret it, dearie. Do you accept our offer? With all my heart. And so the maiden led the three old spinners into the castle. The first pedaled, the second licked, and the third twisted, and never had anyone spun faster. By morning, all the flax in the room was spun into thread, and the maiden was given to the prince as his bride. However, the bride feared that once married, she would be asked to repeat the task. On the day of her wedding, the bride kept her promise and invited the spinners to the head table, claiming them as her aunts. When the bridegroom saw the first spinner, he said, How did you get such a large flat foot? From pedaling the wheel, from pedaling the wheel. And to the second, he asked, How did you get such a large lip? From licking the flax, from licking the flax. And to the third, he asked, how did you get such a huge thumb? From twisting the thread, from twisting the thread. Upon hearing this, the prince was alarmed and declared, Never shall my beautiful wife touch a spinning wheel again. And the pride lived happily till the end of her days.
Now, if that's the story, we could give to Brentano. You didn't write our stories. I record them in pictures, not words. It's the only way I could remember it. A book of stories should have drawings. Your drawings. Perhaps someday, but not today. Loti, what are you doing here? Jacob said you came here looking for more stories. And you gave him one, didn't you, Janetta? I told him one too, Loti. Come along, Malkin. I'll tuck you in. Tu ne pas Soissage, ma petite. I'll wait for you outside. You promised not to tell my brothers any more stories. I told him Briar Rose. Briar Rose? Why? I wanted Malkin to hear it, so she'll know that she can be loved. Why couldn't she? She says it herself, Loti. She's plain. I'm attractive, Loti. That's honest, not vain. And it means I'll never know if I'm really loved. Forgive me if I'm not sympathetic. And you, Jeanetta, why did you tell her the three spinners? You think it'll make men not want their wives to spin? Of course not, Loti. We all spin our beauty away. But if this, at least our husbands will know it. Jeanetta offers Loti a hand, but Loti refuses it and leaves abruptly. The Grimm apartment the next morning. Wilhelm Grimm clears off the furniture in the apartment as Jenny and Nettie von Dross enter the Grimm family apartment. Please forgive the mess. It's quite all right, Wilhelm. Here, let me help you. Jenny takes over the cleaning as Wilhelm sits, winded. Lodi has been gone for weeks, and she's still in bed this morning. But you've been here, and you've been awake. Nettie! Men can clean as well as women. It's not that five brothers can't keep house, it's that they won't keep house. Sister. If the house is a mess, is it the fault of five brothers who are there, or one sister who is not? It's hard to argue with her. What she lacks in tact, she makes up for in logic. Thank you for inviting us. I was glad to find you're in town. You saved me the trip to Bocker Hall. We came for the ball, and our aunt was good enough to put us up for the night. But not good enough to provide us with breakfast. Nettie! If you want our stories, you'll have to feed us. There isn't much, but I'll see what we have in the kitchen. Are you just going to stand there and let me straighten? I'm their house guest, not their housemaid. If we, if we clean up after them, we're, we're allowing them to be lazy. Nettie von Drost, must you constantly radiate your brilliance? My apologies, Jenny. I'll hide my light under a bushel. The brothers have a higher purpose in collecting our stories. And Napoleon has a higher purpose in collecting our lands. We enrich the stories with maidenly wisdom. Then men pass them off as their own. I found some cold coffee and toast. That would be fine, Wilhelm. How kind of you to give it to us rather than to the ducks. Nettie! Even so, you won't get a story from me. Nettie thinks she could publish her own. A hopeful aspiration, if not a sensible one. I'll share one with you, Wilhelm. And I'll enlighten it with my brilliance. Very well, I'm listening. Don't you need to write it down? First I listen, then I write. Jakob always has a pen in his hand. True. He would probably transcribe his own death sentence. This is the story of the Twelve Dancing Princesses. Once upon a time, there was a king with twelve daughters, each more beautiful than the next. Which made the youngest one most beautiful, and therefore most loved. And they all slept together in one large bedroom. Every night, the king bid his twelve daughters good night. And sometimes he remembered their names. And then he took his key and locked them all inside. After all, he had to protect his possessions. When the king opened the door in the morning and bid each, daughter, each one of his daughters good morning, he saw their new shoes had been danced to pieces. Same thing happened every morning. When the king demanded to know what happened, none of his daughters would speak. For what can a maiden call her own if she doesn't keep her secrets? The king proclaimed that any young man who discovered the secret could marry the daughter of his choice. 
but if the man failed, he'd never be allowed to marry. Nettie! Would it be better if the man were killed? Continue. Several princes accepted the king's offer. The man would stand guard in the princess's bedroom, but the daughters would offer him wine, which put him to sleep. In the morning, the king would wake up to a sleeping prince and banish him to a lonely life. The next night, the sisters did the same thing with the next prince. And since men never help one another, the trick worked every time. Suitors came and suitors went. And the land was filled with bachelor princes. And every morning, the princess's shoes had been danced to pieces. Now, it so happened that a poor soldier who was wounded in battle and could no longer serve met an old woman on the road. She told him of the king's challenge and warned him not to drink the wine. She also gave him a cloak which made him invisible. That night, as the soldier stood guard, the princesses offered him wine. The soldier pretended to drink it, but let it run down his shirt. The princesses pretended to go to bed and the soldier pretended to fall asleep. And the youngest opened a secret passage. She was the smartest and set her sisters free. Nettie, I'm not going to continue if you keep interrupting my story. You mean improving your story? Would you like some more coffee? The youngest one is always the smartest. Smartest, perhaps, but not the wisest. You lack manners and intellect. The toast is only a little stale. Very well. We'll pretend that older means wiser. You were telling a story? A foolish story. A soldier can't marry a princess. Everyone knows that. I believe we'll be going now. Denny, please. I want to hear how it ends. Very well. But no more interruptions. No more than strictly necessary. The eldest princess led her sisters through the woods. They followed a glorious avenue of trees whose leaves were like glittering silver. The soldier put on the cloak and followed silently behind. Sister, I have a feeling like something's going to happen tonight. You silly goose, you're always afraid. Would you rather be safe than free? On the other side of the wood stood a golden pavilion where the drums and the trumpets and the violins could be heard and the sisters danced through the night. When all their shoes had been danced through, they prepared to return to the palace. The soldier broke a branch from the silver tree and it made a terrible crack. What was that sound? Someone's following us. Our secret will be safe unless one of us reveals it. The soldier discovered their secret, but did he choose to reveal it? Why wouldn't he? If he loved the princesses, he'd let them be free. But then he, he would always be lonely. This is personal, isn't it? If you don't want to share it... It could bring hope to other maidens. But the story won't be ours anymore. Are you willing to continue? Very well. But remember who shared it. The princesses snuck back through the secret passage. But the soldier had gotten back first and showed them the silver branch. 
If one of you would accept my hand, I'll tell your father your secret. If not, I'll go my way. Because the soldier gave him a choice, the older sister loved him, and they lived happily. And the youngest sister escaped into the woods and lived happily by herself. And the others danced in the palace each night until they found husbands who loved them. Is that the way you heard it from your governess? Our version is better. We're not collecting stories. We're collecting folk tales. I need to record it the way you first heard it. I know. Then why did you tell it that way? Nettie, may I please speak to Wilhelm alone? If you're willing to risk your reputation. Uh, Jakob is in our study, uh, but we're forbidden to disturb him. I'll banish myself to the kitchen where all maidens belong. Nettie. I'm going, I'm going. Forgive my sister. She's just high-spirited. It's more than that. You think she's wicked? No, she's bursting with intelligence. If she tried to hold it in, she'd explode. She'll have to contain it if she wants to marry. She'll have to release it if she wants to write. Write? And publish, and make a name for herself. I've read her stories. If I'm any judge of writing, she'll succeed. What about me? Am I not bursting with intelligence? You've learned to hold it inside. So, that's it. My brilliance dies within me. It radiates in your manners, in your kindness, in your eyes. Wilhelm, are you saying what I think you're saying? No. You deserve a man who's healthy and strong, who won't leave you as a widow. But a scholar like yourself. We were princes until my father died. Now we are only soldiers. Father likes you, Wilhelm. He respects you. He also respects social custom. Thank you for your story, Jenny. But a princess can't marry a soldier. She starts to leave, turns back, and kisses Wilhelm on the cheek, and exits into the kitchen. Loti enters in her night robe, having been eavesdropping. Wilhelm notices her. I'm sorry, Loti. But they told me another story. Well, you have a few. I have the whole collection. You do? I've hidden the manuscripts, and I'm not going to let you have them unless you acknowledge the tellers. If we do, the stories will never be read. If you don't, the stories will never be found. <laughs> I'm all right, Lodi. I'm not long for this world. But while I'm here, I want to see our stories in print. Wilhelm, maybe I'm being selfish. Maybe I should just give them back. You shouldn't give in, like the maidens do in the stories. You need a better doctor. If only we could afford. Carl is getting the money. How? He has nothing of value except... His violin. The lobby of the hotel where the Van Hatzenhausen sisters are staying. Winnie and Anna Van Hatzenhausen. Thank you for buying my violin, Sophie. I'm glad we were in town for the ball. Uh, it, it's yours. The price you paid me is more than fair. Don't let Father know. He made me sell my violin when I got engaged. Do you love him, Sophie? I hardly know him, but it's a proper match. But she had to sell her violin. Your family doesn't need the money. It's father's way of clipping our wings. Our sisters gave up their instruments when they married, and Sophie had to do the same. Don't your sister's husbands let them play? Fern's husband does. Marianne's doesn't. We ladies, we obey. Our husbands have to give us the instruments, if they're willing to let us play. We can't bring our own to the marriage. Folk music is to your family what folk tales are to mine. You, Aren't you can't you? let them take your music. Aren't you selling your own instrument? Well, Wilhelm needs a doctor, and we don't have the means. We both understand our duty to our family. Sophie, father didn't force you to sell your violin. 
He expected me to do so, and that's force enough. I'm keeping my instrument when I get married. My groom will take both of us or neither. You say that now, Anna, but when, wait till your time comes. You'll do the same as Sophie. Winnie, just because you don't speak up doesn't mean I won't. I'd never keep my wife from her music. Then it's too bad you didn't court me, Carl. You know what father says, Sophie. We must marry within our station. But the Grimm brothers are like our own brothers. We can tell them stories, but they're below our social status. Why does that matter? The von Hochshausens have kept their place for 400 years at, because we've kept to our own. I'm sorry to have disturbed you. I'll be, I'll just let you be. You know, Carl, let's share a story with music, like we used to do in a story circle. But I don't have my violin. Use mine. It's a beautiful instrument. I'll hate to part with it. It's as old as the songs it sings. The Freeman Town Musicians. You know that one, don't you? Will you join us? Certainly. If Father doesn't find out. Start with this sad tune, Carl. As you wish. There was once an old donkey who, in her pride, for bushels of grain to the mill. She was a strong and obedient servant. However, once she reached the age of 20, her strength was coming to an end. When she tripped on the road, her owner declared she would sell the donkey for glue. After the owner left, the donkey declared, I'll strike out on my own. I still have my beautiful braying voice. I've heard that in Bremen, the townsfolk throw coins to the musicians. I may be old, but I can still make people happy with my music. And so the old donkey headed off to Bremen. The donkey hadn't traveled far when she came across an old hunting dog moaning by the side of the road. Why the sad song, Sister Hound? because I'm gro I've grown too old to hunt. In my prime, I could track a fox upstream, but now I'm, that I'm old, I couldn't catch a fox if it leapt into my paws. I'm no further used to this world. You still howl beautifully. Come, sister, and we shall bray and howl and bray it. And so the two of them headed down the road together. Before long, they came to an old master cat who was screeching as if her tail were stuck in a ringer. What's the matter, Sister Cat? Your song would make a statue weep. In my prime, I used to look at a mouse and the creature would fall over dead from fear. Now, the mice steal my table scraps under my nose. My master plans to drown me in the river, and I'm too slow to run away. All I can do is lament my fate. What music you make? Why don't you come with us to Bremen? We'll be the best musical we'll be the best musical trio the townsfolk have ever seen. And so off the three of them went to Bremen. By and by, they came upon a rooster who was crowing to wake the dead. Why the sad crowing, brother rooster? You'll make the sound go down rather than bringing it up. And it's mid-afternoon, not morning. My crowing used to wake the sun. Then it only woke the farmer and... Now I'm old and wake up at noon. My mistress plans to cook me for soup. Why don't you come with us? We're going to Bremen Town. We're going to sing for our supper. The farmers in the cottages closed their shutters. 
The merchants in their wagons threw coins to make them stop. And the beasts were proud to be paid musicians. The four swam headed down the road. They sought shelter because it was getting dark in an abandoned house. However, when they looked through the window, they saw it was a hideout for robbers. As they approached the hideout, the donkey brayed. The dog barked. The cat shrieked. And the rooster crowed like an army trumpet. Then the battle ensued. And the animals drove the robbers out of the hideout. After the robbers were all gone, the donkey settled in the dung heap. The dog lay down behind the door. The cat curled up on the rug by the fire. And the rooster perched in the rafters. As they settled down, they began to sing to each other. Perhaps it wasn't a beautiful song. Perhaps the town folk of Bremen would have thrown stones instead of coins. But the four friends were happy, and they stayed together to the end of their days. What an excellent story. Did you hear it from your nursemaid? Time and time again. She was once a beauty, till she fell on hard times. But she still sang us songs and told us stories. Thank you for letting me play again. We could have made beautiful music together. Keep it, Carl. No, you need it more than I do, and I need the money. If our stories have been different... We must live with the stories that we have been given. The Grimm apartment later that afternoon. We've gathered 11 stories. That's not for a booklet, but not for a book. Did Lodi say she has the other uh, stories? Uh, yes, she admitted she did. She might be lying. Do you really want to give them to Brantano? Wilhelm's right. He might change them to suit his own purposes. I made a copy, and I'm keeping it with me. We need Brantano to get the stories read. And the maidens need us to get their stories heard. Brantano might not acknowledge us. That would be poetic justice. Here's a clean shirt for each of you. Thank you, Lottie. I do have one story I could tell you to make an even dozen. Did you hear it to Marburg? I've lived it. The tale of a silent maiden. It's not about you, Lottie. You're anything but silent. Jacob. If you listen, I'll tell it to you, and you can retell it to the world. I'm listening. Listen with your ears and not your pen. Once there was a maiden whose five brothers were abducted by an evil witch. The only clues she had when her brothers disappeared were five white feathers that had fallen in the yard. The maiden tossed the feathers into the air and followed them as they blew. She trailed them into the woods through a cottage, to a cottage where they flew through an upper window. She climbed through the, the window and cried for the brothers she loved. But then at midnight, five great swans flew through the window cast aside their feathers, and became the brother she loved. Their sister cried, what can I do to set you free? You'd have to go five years without speaking or laughing, and knit five shirts out of nettles. If a single word escapes your lips, all your work would be for naught. And so she knitted nettles into shirts. She knitted till her fingers were aching. She knitted while the seasons changed. She knitted when a prince saw her beauty and took her as his wife. She knitted while she was charged with witchcraft and sentenced to burn at the stake. But as the flames rose up around her, her brother swans appeared. She threw out the nettle shirts she had been knitting for those five long years. She dropped them over her brothers, and once again, they were human. However, none of them was ever completely whole, for she never completed the sleeves. Each was left with the wing of a swan and hid his imperfection. But their sister told them to show their wings, for our flaws allow us to fly. I'll go take care of your shirts. Wait, Lottie, I have something for you. It, it, it's the preface to our collection. I know what it says. Perhaps it will surprise you. These stories were shared by clever maidens who heard them as children and have made them their own. We owe these stories not to German peasants, but to our sister storytellers. The Wilds, the Hassenflugs, the Von Drotz, 
the von Hoxhausens, and our faithful sister, Loti. They heard the stories from servants. Now the stories will serve our people. Your faithful sisters, thank you. Here are your missing stories. You can give them to Brentano. We'll insist on including the preface. What's the matter, Loti? Jakob was right, Wilhelm. If you acknowledge who told you the stories, they'll never be printed. And these stories must be heard. They don't show that maidens should be ignored, but they show that they are ignored. And they give us a voice. Credit the stories to the brothers, Grimm, for your sisters are almost like your brothers. This I'll keep for myself and show to the others. You acknowledge what we've given, but no one can know who gave them. Someday the story will be known. Perhaps, but not today. Will you let us print the five swans, Lochi? No one must know that I wrote it, but you all know that I've lived it. And call it the six swans, for I also hide my wings. 